assassination attempt, Trump back in office, all of this and more on today's episode of Two Way Roundup. Hi, I am Emma Whitman with the Attorneys for Freedom, also here with Brittany LeBerry and Rachel Moss. How are you guys doing? Good. Doing good. I'm excited for our first ever Trump-themed episode. (laughs) Yeah, we got some fun updates and fun things to talk about related to Trump and Second Amendment rights. So we'll kick it off with the first topic of what Trump has been talking about on his campaign trail and up to current date, which is wanting to pass legislation for a concealed carry reciprocity throughout all of the states. Have you guys heard about this? Yeah, I've heard a lot about this. A lot of people in the gun owner community, Second Amendment community, are really excited about this. A lot of people are concealed carry permit holders and want to know how this legislation might affect them. Yeah, one thing he has said on his campaign trail and throughout his speeches is that your Second Amendment rights should not end at the borders of your own state. And right now we know that if you have a concealed carry permit, that does have reciprocity with certain states, um, but definitely not all of them. So today we're going to dive into how is this going to get passed if Trump does get in office? What is the current state of permits right now? So let's dive in and chat about it. Awesome. So to get started, to understand what would happen is it's either going to come from the Senate or House of Representatives. They can propose a bill to either amend the current law or to pass new legislation for this concealed carry reciprocity throughout all the states. So say that the U.S. Senate proposes this. They're going to start with their own subcommittees working to make any changes and get a final version of this bill. They will then vote on it. And if it passes with them, it'll shift over to the other chamber where they're going to do the same thing. They're going to put together a subcommittee. They're going to go through rounds of edits, make any changes to the bill that they think is appropriate and vote on it themselves. From there, if it passes, both chambers are going to come together, make any final additions, do a final vote. If it does pass, it'll then be presented to now going to be President Trump, who will have a chance to look at it and sign it into legislation, or he would have the option to veto. But based on what we know about Trump and his campaign trail and statements being made, this is definitely something he is looking to get enacted into law. He attempted this prior, but we do have a change in makeup with the Senate and House of Representatives. But as of right now, it does look like Trump will have the majority in the Senate and House of Representatives. Yeah, and that's definitely huge. But one thing to note is these margins are pretty small. Um, Republicans have a majority in both the House and the Senate by just a little bit. And I think as we've seen in the past few years, the Republicans aren't a completely unified voting bloc in, in neither the Senate nor the House. And so I think there's a chance that some of the more moderate Republicans may not necessarily be for something like this. I think there's a good chance, as long as it's reasonable legislation, that all the Republicans will come on board to get something like this passed. Because I think this makes sense to have something like concealed carry reciprocity. I know in our office, at least, this is something we get tons of questions about. People ask when I'm traveling, Will my concealed carry permit that I have in this state apply in another state? Are there different firearms rules that I'm going to have to abide by in different states? And there's a lot of confusion regarding how to get the concealed carry permit and which states it will apply in after someone gets it. So I think legislation like this would go to solving a lot of confusion for gun owners. Absolutely. And there's so many nuances to where you can take your firearm as well, even with the concealed carry permits. Mm -hmm. So it's important to know what state your CCW or concealed carry permit is in, what states have reciprocity with your state, and what does that reciprocity mean? So in Arizona, we can conceal carry without a permit compared to California or New York, where you absolutely need a permit. And those permits have lots of restrictions that come along with them. But then you also need to be educated on if you're going to be traveling outside your state lines. You know, for example, Arizona has 12 other states that they have reciprocity with, and then 25 states that they have reciprocity with, but with certain restrictions. So it's important to know not only where can you travel freely with this permit, and also what are restrictions that could be imposed on you, and what is the state law of where you're going to. Making sure you're educated while you're traveling is super important as well. One thing you should know, too, is there is a federal statute that addresses traveling with a firearm across state lines. That is 18 U.S.C. 926A. 
interstate transportation of firearms. And essentially what this says is you are lawfully able to travel with your firearm if you are traveling from your state where you are lawfully able to possess the firearm to another state where you were also lawfully able to possess and own the firearm. The big question that we get all the time is what if I'm traveling through states where I'm not necessarily allowed to stay and own that firearm under this reciprocity agreement? Or, you know, how do I need to safely transport it? And so the statute outlines the important ways of traveling safely with the firearm, which means not having it in your immediate grasp. And if you are in a vehicle where you don't have an exterior compartment to keep it in, it needs to be in a locked compartment, not your glove box, not your center console, somewhere that is far enough away that if you were to be stopped, officers are going to see it's not in your immediate reach. It's also important to make sure it is unloaded and any ammunition you may also have is locked and secure as well. So definitely important to educate yourself if you're going to be traveling with your firearm, how to safely do so and safely do so under the law. The other big question that we see is what if I'm traveling through a state that I can't have my firearm in, in which case it's important to either plan your route around those states or if you're going to be driving straight through, plan to not make any stops while you're doing so. Yeah, those are definitely important considerations. And then I think another question I have here is if Trump is successful in getting legislation like this passed, do you think we'll see some backlash from some of the states in adding restrictions to where people are able to carry firearms or adding some sort of additional restrictions to their state's concealed carry permits? I definitely wouldn't be surprised if that were to happen. <laughs> um, it's definitely possible that they may try to add restrictions, but we'll have to see the exact language that ends up in this proposed bill for the new legislation, if states are going to have the ability to do that and to what extent. Mm -hmm. Speaking of Trump, we're going to stay on the same subject. We are going to talk about his second assassination attempt. So everybody knows there was two assassination attempts. Everybody knows how the first one ended. And now the second one is actually currently being litigated now. So the defendant currently charged in the second assassination attempt is Ryan Wesley Routh. Now, he did plead not guilty on all charges, and the case is fairly new. So they had the arraignment. The defendant did state that he understood the charges against him. I'll put the indictment on the screen so you can kind of follow along, but there are currently five charges. And they are attempted assassination of a major presidential candidate, possessing a firearm in furtherance of a crime of violence, assaulting a federal officer, felon in possession, and also possession of a firearm with an obliterated serial number. I didn't even know there was a special charge for attempting to assassinate a yes, presidential candidate. Yes, yes. And wow. I did look at the definition of what a major presidential candidate is. And there is also a requirement that it has to be within 120 days of the election, which I thought was oh, kind of interesting. interesting. Hmm. So if you've declared candidacy, but it's 121 days, you can escape this charge? You might. Wow. <laughs> I'm sure they can also bring a different charge, but... Maybe um, attempted murder. I yeah. don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so we know a little bit about the case, right? Everybody, I'm sure, is familiar with it. It happened in Florida at President Trump's golf course. The Secret Service was doing a perimeter check before President Trump got to the specific hole. They did see him. He set up what the people are calling a sniper's nest in the bush. And luckily, they saw the gun move. And that's the whole reason why they caught him. So great job to Secret Service. Fantastic job keeping President Trump safe that day. They were able to catch him. And they did actually find a letter that he wrote prior Prior to the attempt, I'll also put that on the screen. The DOJ is actually the one who released the note, and they've gotten a lot of flack from that because he did say in the note, as you'll see on the screen, that he will offer a $150,000 reward to anybody who finishes the job. So he did state in the letter that this was an assassination attempt. He's sorry that he's failed the public, basically, and that he will offer a cash reward for anybody who finishes the job. So obviously, I understand why the DOJ is gotten flack from that, right? You put out a reward for killing a presidential candidate. I personally don't think that was too smart, especially because that is evidence in the case. And like we've talked about, the public usually doesn't know many details of a case while it's pending. So kind of interesting that they did do that, but they did. And it's on the screen for you to look at it. One of his first court dates, they did talk about his release conditions. He is going to be held during the proceeding of this case. 
And the government turned to a couple things. He's actually been charged or arrested more than 100 times. Wow. A lot of them were traffic offenses, but some of them are serious criminal history and criminal charges. Some of them being possession of a weapon in mass destruction. So he's been charged with that multiple times, one of them being a bomb, other being certain firearms. But clearly... He has some propensity for danger, I would I would argue. And the other thing, too, is that he does often go to Ukraine, and they said that he might be able to slip the border easily and kind of hide in Ukraine. That's another thing that the government argued at his release condition hearing. Now, the government was successful. He will be held pending these proceedings. As I stated earlier, and as you saw in the indictment, one of the charges that he's charged with is felon in possession of a firearm. So as I stated, he has a long rap sheet of criminal history. Not all of them has he gotten a conviction on, but he has been arrested and charged multiple times, especially with serious felonies. Some of that being possessing a firearm as a felon, resisting arrest and obstruction of a law enforcement officer. One of them being the charges stemmed from a three-hour standoff with a firearm against law enforcement. And then also he's been convicted of possession of stolen goods. So he does have a criminal history and that's where that charge comes from. We've talked previously about how a felon in possession would be somewhat questionable, right, of a charge going forward because of the recent Rehemi and Bruin cases. As a reminder to the viewers, Bruin was the case that established a standard that the lower courts have been struggling to apply. So when they are analyzing a current day firearm regulation or law, they are looking to see first, is the person someone who was intended to be protected under the Second Amendment? And if they are, is the modern day regulation one that is a historical analog to a law that was back at the founding. So there's a two-pronged test for Bruin. Rahimi, which was decided in June of 2024 this year, um, relied on Bruin, also talked about this. And so right now what we're seeing is the lower courts have picked up several cases on the felon in possession issue alone. And the problem with Bruin right now is we're seeing different circuit courts applying this exact issue completely different. You know, the Third Circuit decided on this issue and said felon in possession is not constitutional and does not pass um, under Bruin. However, the Eighth Circuit said the exact opposite. So in this case, I think there's definitely room to argue either direction. And we are likely to see in the upcoming term a case just like this or an issue at least just like this making its way back to the Supreme Court. Yeah, because some people are saying here that it goes against the Constitution. It's a, a basically a violation of the Second Amendment to say that felons should not be allowed to possess firearms. So there's a couple camps here. Like you said, the Third Circuit says, yeah, that that is an unconstitutional law. Felons should not be restricted from owning firearms just because of their status as a felon. However, other camps are pointing out the fact that there are some historical analogs that would support disarming felons. There's not a historical twin out there. And as Rahimi found, historical twins aren't required. You don't need to find a one-to-one match in our nation's tradition in order to say that a firearm regulation is allowed. However, some people are arguing that there are significant historical analogs that would allow us to regulate felons not being able to possess firearms. So I think we'll probably one day get a case up to the Supreme Court to really sort out this very specific issue. But I think overall, we're going to see this larger trend that now we have the Bruin standard and the Rahimi standard basically served to back up the Bruin standard, maybe narrow it a little bit. But the Bruin standard is still in place. So we're still going to be getting so many challenges to different firearm regulations. And I think a lot of them are going to have to make it all the way to the Supreme Court to get some sort of resolution. And I think this is one of them. I don't know if um, this individual's counsel is going to bring this up, but I think as a good attorney, it would be smart for his counsel to bring it up, even though he is facing some, I think, other serious charges that will probably land him in prison either way, if I if I had to guess. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And so really, even if it was found, let's just say next year it was found unconstitutional, he still is facing very serious charges where it really wouldn't affect him too much. There's also 
arguments that maybe not all felons should be prohibited possessors, maybe if, if it's a financial crime or if it's not a dangerous crime or something like that. But regardless, his criminal history seems violent. One more thing about this case is the judge's sign. It's just a fun tidbit, I think. It's not too much of the legal analysis, but Judge Cannon is actually the federal judge that's currently on the case. She was randomly selected and she was actually the judge prior that dismissed the criminal classified document mishandling charges against Trump. And so a lot of people are saying, hold on, she might be a little bit biased. The defense attorney in this case actually moved to request the judge to recuse herself at the last hearing. And then Judge Cannon did refuse to step down. So she is still the judge on the case. We'll see that might be some legal issue moving forward as well. But if Judge Cannon believes that she can be the judge and the neutral magistrate, then I trust her decision. Yeah, I think it makes sense for her not to recuse herself because she wasn't a party to the previous case. She was the judge and she acted as a judge in that case, analyzing the evidence and making a decision based on the briefings in that case. She wasn't a witness in the case. She wasn't found to have any misconduct, as far as I'm aware, in the previous case. Just because you've been a judge on a previous case involving a previous party doesn't mean you can never hear a case involving that party ever again. I know there are judges that have heard cases on multiple defendants and plaintiffs over the years um, and seen them on either side of the equation. So it's not really that unusual for a judge to have more than one case involving more than one party. But I understand here there might be some special considerations just because it's going to be a political case and it's going to be a case that a lot of people throughout the nation are going going to um, care about. But I think at the end of the day, she's sticking to the fact that she believes that she's going to be a neutral party. And I agree with you that if she came to that decision, I, I bet it's well supported. Another big consideration here, I think, going back to what you said earlier when we were talking about the potential Trump legislation, you pointed out the fact that we're seeing a Republican Senate, we're going to be seeing a Republican House. But I think another important thing here is we also have what we would consider a, a conservative Supreme Court as well. Technically, you know, Supreme Court justices don't really belong to a party in their position as justices. However, we everyone knows, you know, that Supreme Court justices will lean either to the conservative or liberal side. And here we have a Supreme Court with multiple appointees by Trump already on it. And I wouldn't be surprised that we continue to see maybe some new Trump appointees this next term if certain justices were to step down from the court. So I think we're going to see a very conservative Supreme Court for a time to come. And I think as these Bruin challenges come up, that's going to be important to how these are decided. Because as of now, there have been some differences even among the conservative justices. Justice Thomas, for example, actually dissented, I believe, in Rahimi. And so he disagrees with some of the regulations that the other justices are upholding as historical analogs. However, I think we will see overall some rulings here on firearm regulations that will lean conservative. I'll say with that, that actually takes us to our next and our final topic today in our Trump themed episode. This one's a little, a little less Trump themed, but it involves a New York case and Trump's from New York. So that's the connection I'm going to say makes it fit into the theme, but also still talking about the Supreme Court. This is another case that we'll be talking about today that involves a brewing component in it. And this one's a little different than some of the ones we've talked about, because in the past, the brewing challenges that we've analyzed have gone in front of courts and the courts have made the final decision here. And this one, the case is called Hunter versus Cortland Housing Authority. And this involves uh, New York public housing. And earlier this year, in January 2024, there was some litigation between the two parties. The Second Amendment Foundation was suing the Cortland Housing Authority because the Housing Authority had a firearms ban on their premises. So basically, anyone that wanted to live in the subsidized housing at the Housing Authority had to sign a lease that basically said, I'm not going to be carrying any firearms or possessing any firearms on the Cortland Housing Authority property. So the Second Amendment Foundation sued them and said, 
because this is subsidized housing, housing subsidized by the government, that this violates the Second Amendment. And they brought forward a challenge based on Bruin. So they were asking for a temporary restraining order and temporary preliminary injunction for the court to issue to that effect while this case was ongoing. So that's what we saw the New York District Court do in January of this year. They granted the plaintiff's request and issued that restraining order so that in the meantime, the Cortland Housing Authority would not be able to enforce this firearms ban. What we recently saw just last month was the two parties actually came to a stipulated permanent injunction. So it's a different resolution than what we normally see. This isn't the court saying, yes, plaintiffs, you're right, or no, plaintiffs, you're wrong. These are the two parties coming together and coming to an agreement on what the injunctions should be. So the main point uh, of this injunction that they came to is that the Cortland Housing Authority agreed to remove the firearms ban from their lease. And now individuals that are living in the subsidized housing are able to carry and possess firearms on the property. Which is a huge win for those tenants, right? Especially Mm -hmm. if you're in subsidized housing, your back might be to the wall, right? You need a place to live and this is a place. And if it's in the lease, it's in the lease, right? But this is a huge win for them because they can actually exercise your Second Amendments where before they couldn't even have it in their house, right? They could Mm -hmm. not possess a firearm in their house. So that's absolutely restricting and limiting their Second Amendment rights. So I think this is a great resolution. Now, although there are some more restrictions and I would have liked to see in the stipulated agreement, between the parties, at least the tenants have the ability to possess and use a firearm as long as it is in a legal way, right? They Mm -hmm. made sure to explain (laughs) that the tenants must be doing it the legal way, must have all the permits required and stuff like that. Yeah, and they outlined too that they want to make sure these tenants have the right to self-defense within their unit, within the common areas, and of course to lawfully transport it to their car if they need to. They did outline where they can exercise their self-defense rights on the property and within their unit. So I think, like you two said, this is a huge win. And I think it's interesting to see that we had an agreement here rather than this being fought out in court. Because at the time of the preliminary injunction argument, defense counsel actually uh, made an argument stating that there's no way that the founders could have contemplated something like public housing. So normally when you have to point to a historical analog, you would have to argue that there's something in the nation's tradition that supported this type of firearm regulation. Here, the Cortland Housing Authority was actually arguing, hey, there's not a historical analog here, but it's not our fault because there's no way the founders could have contemplated such a thing like public subsidized housing. So so they were, so they were conceding, basically, that there was no historical analog. Yes. Okay. However, in the past, the courts have found that if there is something that's just completely out of the box, that someone, there's no way founders could have contemplated something like this, we're able to look at more recent analogs. So that's what they're trying to argue here, that because... There's no way founders could have contemplated public housing that we can look a little bit more recently in modern history. We still have to show that this is something that's been regulated for a while, but we don't have to go all the way back to 1790 to see if there's a historical analog. And the court saw through that argument pretty quickly. They said, well, actually, we do think that the founders could have contemplated something like public housing because back at that time, there were equivalents to this. There were things like almshouses, poor houses, poor farms, where people were able to live if they couldn't necessarily afford their own place. So they said, yeah, I think I think the founders could contemplate this sort of situation. So you do need to find a historical analog. And the Cortland Housing Authority wasn't able to find a historical analog. So that's why the plaintiffs won their preliminary injunction way back in January. And I am interested to know a little bit more about what happened in the meantime between January and now, but I think it was pretty, it had to be pretty obvious to Cortland Housing Authority that the writing was on the wall here and that they couldn't win this case. It was better for them to come to some sort of stipulation where they could at least get some of their say in and not uh, drag this through court any longer. This is a great win to show New York that they can't get away with this stuff anymore, right? We finally see some action, and I love that this is in the state of New York because, as we know, New York's one of the worst states when it comes to firearm regulations. So the fact that this happened in New York is, I think, really a we got you moment. Mm-hmm. 
And I think we're going to see more of this to come over the next few years. I think the states are really primed for these kind of Bruin challenges. I think we're going to see organizations like the Second Amendment Foundation continue to find cases like this throughout the country. We've talked in previous videos about the Gun Owners Association of America going after similar Bruin challenges. And I think we'll continue to see this in the future. And I'm really excited because I love when we see a big Second Amendment win like this. I love just expanding individuals' abilities to protect protect themselves and their families. I think that's a necessary and great step forward that New York has taken here. And I hope to see more of this to come. Yeah, and I think it's a great opportunity as well to point out if you know somebody with a case that has a great Bruin Rahimi challenge, um, we would definitely love to hear from you and be able to analyze the case and see if there's something we can do and jump into action as well. Exactly. I know Emma and I have been itching to do a Bruin challenge here. So we would love to hear about your case. Thank you all today for tuning into this video. It was really fun to have a nice Trump themed episode for you today. So if you have any questions or comments, leave them in the comments below. Again, if you would like to learn a little bit more about us, you can go to attorneysforfreedom.com. You can get to meet the whole team on the website and get to know a little bit more about what kind of cases our firm takes on. You can also check us out at attorneysonretainer.us. So Attorneys on Retainer is a self-defense protection program. You can learn all about the program on that website, as well as get to know a little bit more about our AOR network. And if you like this video, you know what to do. Like, comment, share, and subscribe. Thanks again for watching this episode of 2A Roundup. Until next month. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>